Hello and Happy New Year and welcome to the first of our January 2022 series of webinars. I'm Ailey Murray, Senior Counsel in the Employment Team and I'm joined by Tom Hunt, an Associate in the team. In this webinar we're going to be looking at a variety of topics and cases relating to diversity. Diversity and inclusion remain key priorities for many business as well as regulators and investors and it's an important part of the, ES the overall ESG agenda. The inequalities in society continue to be highlighted by the pandemic and there have been a number of other recent changes in this area. So today we'll cover the expected developments in flexible working and family friendly rights, the ethnicity pay gap and disability reporting, and women on boards. We'll also cover a few important cases from the last year. However, we're going to start with the proposed reforms to the sexual harassment protections. In 2019, the government ran a consultation on possible reforms to the law on workplace sexual harassment. In July of last year, the government published its response to that consultation. The main finding being that many people were supportive of a new duty to prevent harassment in, in workplace, with the idea being that it would prompt employers to take steps to tackle harassment. And in light of this, government has said that it plans to put in place a new duty on employers to prevent workplace sexual harassment by introducing a statutory code of practice. This will also introduce explicit protections for employees from harassment by third parties in the workplace, such as clients, customers and suppliers. The government is also going to look at extending the time limit for bringing discrimination and harassment claims in an employment tribunal from the current three months to six months. So no timetable has been set for these laws to be introduced, but the government has said the changes will be introduced as soon as parliamentary time allows. And given everything else that's going on at the moment, we're not expecting anything to be imminent. In the meantime, employers should consider if they need to put in place or update workplace harassment policies. In 2020, the Equality and Human Rights Commission brought out technical guidance on harassment in the work, in, at work and recommended that employers have in place detailed harassment policies, which contain examples of the different types of harassment that might be relevant to their workplace. In our experience, many employers still don't have this sort of detail in their policy, so now might be quite a good time to look at it. We also want to touch on flexible working, which obviously lots of businesses have been forced to adopt and adapt to throughout the pandemic. So whilst the response to the Omicron variant has obviously seen working from home guidance reintroduced for the time being, before this we were seeing lots of businesses consider their future ways of working, um, often in response to formal requests from employees to be able to work in a more flexible way. So whilst lots of businesses have of their own volition made flexible working more widely available, the government itself is also considering whether the legal framework for flexible working should be changed to better encourage and support flexible working. The government recently ran a consultation which concluded on the 1st of December on flexible working with the key proposal being making the right to request flexible working available from the start of employment. Currently, only employees with at least six months service have the right to submit a formal flexible working request. The consultation will also consider a number of other points, so whether the permitted grounds for refusing a flexible working request remain appropriate or whether they should be amended, um, whether employees should be able to make a request more than once every 12 months, which is the current limit, whether employers should be required to suggest alternatives when they're refusing a request, um, and also whether employers should be given a shorter time frame in which to respond to requests. So currently employers only have three months to respond. We don't currently have a timetable in which the response to this consultation will be published. So it's just a case of watch this space for now to see what changes may materialise. There have been a few other family friendly developments in the past couple of years, although none have been brought into law yet. In 2019, the government committed to extending the priority right that women on maternity leave have to suitable alternative vacancies on redundancy. Currently, only employees who are on maternity leave have priority to a suitable alternative vacancy. And under the proposals, this right would be extended to cover the period from the moment the woman first informs her employer of her pregnancy to six months after her return. It was expected that this would be brought into law in the new employment bill. However, we still have no indication of when that bill might be brought in. The government has also said it will introduce a new right to unpaid carers leave. This will allow employees to take up to one week of unpaid leave per year to care for a dependent with a long-term care need. 
it will be available to all employees, irrespective of how long they have worked for the employer, and will be able to be taken as individual days or half days up to and up to one a block of one week. Employees will need to give notice that is twice the length of the time being requested, plus one day. Um, employers will not be able to deny a request, but will be able to postpone the leave where the business would be unduly disrupted. A recurring theme here, as with the other proposals, the government has not given a date for when this new leave will become effective, but has said that it will be introduced when parliamentary time allows. So another proposal that the government has made, which again, we haven't seen much movement on recently, is around introducing ethnicity pay gap requirements. So the government's proposed introducing a requirement for employers with at least 250 employees to report on their ethnicity pay gap. A public consultation on the proposal closed way back in January 2019, but again, the government is still to publish its conclusions. So whilst we're yet to see concrete legislative proposals in this area, what we have been seeing is a trend in some organisations towards voluntarily publishing this type of data. A 2020 report from PwC found that about half, the half of the businesses they surveyed were planning on voluntarily disclosing their ethnicity pay gap within three years. Organisations that do so voluntarily, however, do face some tricky questions about collecting and presenting this data. So, for example, should employers just record the gap between white and non-white employees, or should the data be broken down across ethnic groups separately? As and when the government does publish its response to the consultation, we'll obviously get a better idea of what this regime will look like, which will hopefully give greater clarity to employers, especially those who are doing so voluntarily. In December of last year, the government also launched a consultation on disability workforce reporting. The consultation is part of the government exploring how best to increase transparency and reporting practices that support the cultural changes required to build a more inclusive society. This consultation is asking for businesses to provide details on their current practices, including what works well, and to provide their views on whether reporting should be mandatory or voluntary, as well as whether the, whether there are any alternative approaches that could be taken to enhance transparency and increase inclusive practices. The consultation is due to close on 25th of March this year. Finally, moving on to women on boards. In early November last year, the government announced the FTSE Women Leaders Review, which will monitor female representation in senior leadership roles and on boards of UK listed companies. This new review replaces the Hampton Alexander Review, which published its final report in February last year. That report indicated that progress was being made with women making up around 40% in aggregate of non-executive director positions on FTSE 350 boards. However, the target of having a minimum of 33% representation on FTSE 100 boards was not met, and women make up only 14% of the executive board positions in the FTSE 100. New targets and recommendations have not yet been set. However, a portal was open until the end of November last year to enable companies to submit the relevant data, with a report on gender diversity expected to be published in February this year. We'll now move on to cover some key diversity-related cases of the past year. So the first case we wanted to talk about is Ale and Galen, which involved a claim for race discrimination and a claim for harassment related to race. Just by way of quick legal background, um, where an employee is shown to have committed harassment during the course of their employment, the employer will normally be liable for the actions of that employee. This is unless the employer can show that they took all reasonable steps to prevent that employee from committing the harassment. So this is known as the reasonable steps defense. Obviously one way that many employers try to do this is to carry out harassment training, which is what was at issue in this case. So to run through the facts quickly, the claimant, Mr. Galen, was employed by LA until he was terminated in 2017 on the grounds of poor performance. He subsequently submitted a complaint to his employer saying that he had been subjected to harassment due to his race by one of his colleagues, Mr. Pearson. Ale carried out an investigation and found that Mr. Pearson had indeed made racist remarks to Mr. Galen 
and so decided that Mr Pearson should be sent to undertake further equality and diversity training. The claimant then brought a tribunal claim for harassment um, and discrimination due to race against his employer. The tribunal found that Mr Pearson had regularly made racist remarks and that two managers as well had also been aware of such comment but hadn't taken any action. The employer sought to argue that it had taken all reasonable steps to prevent the harassment, um, so to run the reasonable steps defence, um, because bullying and harassment training had been delivered to Mr Pearson and other employees in 2015. So this was two years before Mr Galen's complaint was raised. However, this defence was rejected by the tribunal and the decision confirmed on appeal. So the tribunal held that the training had essentially become stale um, and that refreshing the training more recently would have been a reasonable step for the employer to have taken to prevent, try and prevent the harassment. The Employment Appeal Tribunal also criticised the quality of the training um, as it didn't refer to harassment or race in sufficient detail. So in short, a really important takeaway from this case is just how important having regular and good quality training on issues relating to discrimination, harassment and equal opportunities is. In this case, it had been two years since um, Mr Pearson had undertaken the training, but as well as the frequency of the training, the tribunal made it really clear that the quality of training is also key. And so we are seeing and helping lots of clients with reviewing this type of training that they run on these sorts of topics. So the next case is Follows versus Nationwide Building Society, and it's about discrimination by association. So discrimination by association occurs where an employee is discriminated against, not because of a protected characteristic that they have, but because of the characteristic of someone they associate with, for example, a disabled spouse or child. And this case shows how far the protection can potentially extend. The employee in this case was a senior lending manager at a building society. She was employed on a home worker contract and worked primarily from home to allow her to care for her disabled, her disabled mother. However, she attended the office two to three days per week, and she had one male colleague who was also employed on a homework contract, but he was not a carer nor himself disabled. The employer decided to reduce the number of senior lending managers and to require their role to be office-based full-time. Although there were enough volunteers for redundancy to avoid compulsory redundancies, the employer convinced some of the volunteers to stay and instead dismissed the two home workers. The employee brought claims for, among other things, direct and indirect disability discrimination by association based on being a carer for her disabled mother. The Employment Tribunal rejected the direct discrimination claim as the employee was dismissed not for her caring responsibilities, but because she was a home worker. However, the tribunal found that the redundancy dismissal constituted unlawful indirect disability discrimination by association. The employer's requirement that senior lending managers be office-based indirectly discriminated against the employee as a carer. Further, the office-based requirement was not justified. So the employer argued that it was necessary to provide effective on-site on managerial supervision and support to junior staff. However, the employer failed to take into account the employee's history of excellent feedback on supervision and also failed to consider less discriminatory ways of achieving the same result, such as having the employee being home-based but coming into the office two to three days a week as she had done previously. The employee was therefore discriminated against, not because of any disability she had, but because of her mother's disability. So this case highlights the dangers of employers imposing a requirement for staff to be completely office-based without considering the individual circumstances of employees. So such a requirement is likely to discriminate indirectly against women who are more likely to have caring responsibilities. And it may also lead to indirect discrimination by association for employees who care for disabled relatives. Indirect discrimination can, in some cases, be justified. However, the employer would need to show that it has a very good reason for insisting on an office-based office -based working and that it has considered all the alternatives, including hybrid working arrangements. For an employer to be able to insist on a role being offered based, it would need to show that remote or hybrid arrangements are unworkable. So this would need them to have tested that and ideally have evidence to back that position up. This is particularly challenging for many employers now, um, given the widespread pandemic related home working. It was also previously assumed that the concept of discrimination by association only applied to direct discrimination and harassment. 
This case extends it to indirect discrimination as well. An employment as an employment tribunal ruling, the decision is not binding, but it is based on European case law, which remains applicable in the, in the UK um, following Brexit. It remains to be seen whether the ruling will be appealed and whether a similar approach will be taken by tri tribunals in future. So the final case um, is a recent case in which the tribunal discussed flexible working again um, and the potential discrimination issues that could arise when implementing flexible working policies. Obviously, this has been a really topical area and it's therefore important to be alive to these sort of potential discrimination risks when considering any flexible working practices and flexible working requests that employees might submit. So in this case, the claimant Dobson she was employed as a community nurse for the North Cumbria NHS Trust, and she was engaged to work on fixed days. The trust decided that they wanted to introduce a requirement that its nurses, which included the claimants, work flexibly, um, and this included performing some work at weekends. Dobson was unable to comply with this working pattern because she had caring responsibilities for her three children, to, um, two of whom were disabled, um, and so she was unable to work at weekends. Um, and as a result, the trust decided to dismiss her. She submitted a claim for unfair dismissal um, and indirect sex discrimination. Now, to make out her indirect sex discrimination claim, what she had to show was that the trust decision to require its nurses to work flexibly applied both to male and female employees, but happened to put female employees, including the claimant, at a particular disadvantage when compared to male employees. So in the first instance, the employment tribunal dismissed the claim. They found that there was no evidence that the flexible working rules put women at a particular disadvantage to men. It cited the fact that all of the claimants, female team members were able to meet the requirement. Um, and so whilst the claimant herself was placed at a particular disadvantage, the rules didn't place female employees as a group at a disadvantage compared to her male colleagues. However, the claimant successfully challenged this decision on appeal. So in particular, the Employment Appeal Tribunal held that the original tribunal should have considered the fact that generally more women than men tend to have childcare responsibilities, which in turn can limit their ability to work certain hours. So this could therefore impact their ability to comply with flexible working requirements of the type set by the NHS Trust. So this imbalance is referred to as the child, child care disparity between men and women. So the appeal tribunal did note that societal norms can obviously change over time and whether women continue to bear the brunt of child care responsibilities could shift over time and so it might not always be a factor that needs to be considered. However, it decided for the time being that it is a factor the tribunal should have taken into account. So in terms of a takeaway, this case just serves as a, as a reminder to consider really carefully how any flexible working patterns or policies could impact groups of employees differently. And in particular, whether female employees could be disadvantaged. Whilst not an issue in this case, it is also worth bearing in mind that the childcare disparity, um, just to have it in mind when considering formal flexible working requests, so if you don't have a reasonable basis on which to turn down a flexible working request, then there could be a risk that the employee raises allegations of discrimination, particularly where requests are received from female employees and they've requested flexible working due to child care commitments. And that wraps up our webinar. So we hope you found it useful and thank you for joining us. And please look out for the next in this January series, which is covering recruitment and retention.